Hey everyone. I'm going to talk to you for just a little while about some of the more um, prominent art and architectural um, ideas from um, the Middle East. And a lot of this is in your textbook as well, but I've just chosen those sorts of things that I thought were the most interesting. So I'm going to be going back and forth between this um, outline that I'll provide for you all with a few images in it and a um, a set of images that we can look at a little more in a little more large sense. Um, I'm going to begin though in our folder to so you can see where where we're talking about. In our first week we just jumped right into Gilgamesh and didn't really talk much about uh, the part of the world that we're in. And you see Africa down here, Europe, Asia, Russia, right? So we're looking at this green area. We're going to spend time in um, an upcoming week on Egypt your Sinai Peninsula, Syria, going up here into Turkey, um, bordered by the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, um, Iraq here in the middle, Iran, Saudi Arabia. So that's sort of the part of the world that we're in. And in this uh, map, you can see the Persian Gulf down here, Caspian Sea, um, the Mediterranean and the Black Sea is up here. These uh, bodies of water, particularly the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, will come up again for us as we move forward. But the reason I chose this particular image is um, to show you the expanse of what's considered Mesopotamia, this sort of green area. And that changes as, um, as different parts of this area come under Mesopotamian rule under various groups like the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Hittites, etc. And it shrinks and grows. Um, and then also I wanted you to be able to see how long that, we have two rivers here, it's kind of hard to trace here from the Persian Gulf. Um, we've got the Euphrates going all the way up into Turkey and then we've got um, another river here, the Tigris, right, that goes down and, and meets up with um, Euphrates, Euphrates as well. So those are our two big um, river systems. All right. So let's go back to our first picture here. And you can see, as you, as you could with the other um, image as well, a lot of these cities, or Oric, etc., um, they at one time would have been right along the river itself because for many reasons people settled along rivers. Um, food, water, easy way to transport goods, um, and but you can see that the waterways have moved. So some of these places now seem to be out in the middle of nowhere and you wonder why in the world would anybody have uh, developed a settlement there? Well at one time they were probably closer to the water and this area used to be a little greener. If you go online um, and, and look at some pictures of the Middle East, um, you can see areas, particularly down here around the Gulf area, that used to be marshy. We had people living down in these marsh areas, a lot of hunting, fishing, and we'll see when we get to e Egypt, there's a similar sort of marsh area there. Um, and uh, Saddam Hussein has, had his own reasons for draining the marshland and, and creating a lot of havoc down there for both people and um, species and organizations are working now to try and reverse some of that damage. But this area was all marshy, not just the sandy place that you see now. It's hard to envision why anybody would want to live there and, until you realize at one point it was um, more water intensive and more green. So we're going to um, start with the most important element of um, Mesopotamian architecture, and that's the temple. And the temple is the center of Mesopotamian life. Everything revolves around building this temple, worship at the temple, the regulation of all life is geared towards this, this kind of temple hierarchy. Here's the temple at the top, all right? That's considered the temple. The temple, of course, is a place of worship. And unlike what you think of now as, as a church or a, a synagogue or a mosque even, um, people did not go up inside of this temple to worship. Um, any worship was down out here in the open air, outdoor altars. Only the priests were allowed up inside of the temple. 
And we'll spend a good bit of time going throughout the semester talking about the architecture of sacred buildings because that's really the, the, at the heart of most uh, public building works um, until after the Renaissance. So we'll talk about a lot about what these um, architectural um, features have in common, right? These, these uh, sacred buildings, what they have in common, and then what distinguishes them. This building underneath, this platform, is called a ziggurat. And this held up the, um, the temple, but it was not hollow. You couldn't go inside this. It's just there to hold up the structure, to lift it up, um, up off of the um, plain below. All right, a little larger image. And here's an aerial view of a particular temple. I believe this is the uh, temple of, of Uruk. Um, and you can see that the temple is gone, but the ziggurat remains. And you can see the, the stairways going up to that. And that's how the priests would have um, gone up there. And you can see how dry the land is, but it would not have been that way when the temple was actually built. All right, we'll look at a couple more elements, and then I'll uh, pause the video and start a second one so they're easier to upload. So a second thing we're going to talk about, uh, make sure that that's correct, um, yes, is this particular vase, and I use this one, the Warka vase is what it's been called, um, because it shows us a feature of um, early art that takes a while to break out of. We'll see this in other cultures as well, and we'll see some changes o over the years. But the, in the beginnings, a lot of art, like on this vase, and this is the same vase, it's just two different sizes of it, we have these bands. Here's one band, here's another band, here's another band, and so on, and so on. These are called registers. That's the um, art term for it. Here we go, registers or friezes. You'll see those used interchangeably. We'll call them friezes when we look at Greek architecture, but the words are in um, interchangeable. And what these friezes do is tell us a story. So it's almost like comic strips where things are organized in rows, in boxes and squares. So we have things going on, um, carrying elements maybe to a, uh, some kind of um, temple worship or some sort of event. You can see men down here carrying things along. You see um, rows of animals, perhaps those were animals that are being sacrificed, and you see also plants. But the term here is register. That's the one that we're most interested in. We also see in a lot of, um, I guess you'd call them art, artwork at the time, sculptures, because art wasn't just necessarily for decoration, it often had a purpose. We see a lot of these little statues, and I mean a lot of them. They're called votive offerings. Here's that word up here, votive offerings. And they are gifts that would have been brought to the temple, um, perhaps if I were a wealthy man, and I, I want to make a donation to the temple because that will put me in good favor with whichever deity I'm, I'm giving the um, sculpture to. And I can carve on here or have carved in there my name or what I'm asking for. And this would be offered up to the deity. And you see they all stand around here with their clasping hands, right? That's just a formal way of standing in front of a deity, right? And you see these huge eyes. That's a big feature of these, these sculptures. They have these huge staring eyes to sort of show that they're always wakeful and waiting for a response from, from the deity. Inside of the, let me see if I have that term here, yeah. Inside of the temple, usually in the center hall, but right in the very center of the building. So if I'm looking, um, at this building from the top view, it would be right in the center, not, not near the outside, but right there in the very center is where the statues to the deities would be, um, the, where the offerings would be made. And this location of a temple is called a cella, C-E-L-L-A. And we'll see this word throughout Greek um, architecture as well. All right, so let's pause here and then we'll look at a few more um, art and architecture terms from 
the Mesopotamian period in the next installment.